Oh, Ratchet and Clank. Right, there's the camera. Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart. This is, oh. If you know me, which, if you're watching this video, you probably don't. I'm Jordan. Thanks for watching. Ratchet and Clank, they're my boys. You know, I gave birth to them. Not true. But I grew up with them. This is my game. The one that fuels me with nostalgia. Like Final Fantasy VII. People adore that game, but I never played it as a child. I'll, I'll try it one day, but I don't have any memories of it to garner any enthusiasm for the remake. But I don't remember a lot of things, though. That's mainly because when I was a child, a man with a shovel broke into our house. Um, he was looking for buried treasure. Things got out of hand. Anyway, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is, however, I'm very happy to say, a fantastic video game and easily one of the best Ratchet games in many years. While Ratchet 2016 reviewed very well, I'm one of those old school fans, very much of the opinion that the 2016 remake was a painfully bland dilution of Ratchet's formula into a type of kid-centric property so devoid of personality that it ended up being completely at odds with the game it was remaking. Rift Apart is thankfully nowhere near that level of pandering. It is, however, not quite the Ratchet game I was hoping for, and it's been an interesting week for myself because for as much as I had an absolute blast playing Rift Apart, it was also quite bittersweet as I realised that Ratchet is nowadays, and has been for a long time, different. The real special, slight edginess and fun satire of the PS2 originals is no longer part of the series and hasn't been for a long time. Rift Apart, while charming and full of comedic moments, feels much more like a game written for kids than those originals. Rift Apart has messages to teach the audience about accepting themselves and eating their vegetables, and similar thematic lessons which are fine by themselves but are told in, quite often, very heavy-handed ways. You are very strange, Ratchet. I've been told that a time or two. Being the grumpy 25-year-old man with the disposition of a 55-year-old woman that I am, there's honestly a big part of me that wants to dislike the game because of it. A part of me that goes, no, it was better when it was just about having fun and making the sly jokes that you only understand when you're older, and I do because I'm a fucking boomer. But everything in Rift Apart is just full of so much joy that it is impossible for me to dislike. But it's YouTube so I'm gonna try my best anyway. Alright, this is going to be the shortest part of the video. Presentation. Wait, what do you want me to say? It looks amazing. The HDR is incredible. It looks so good that you can put it side by side with the 2016 Shaito animated film and it often looks just as good, if not better in some cases. And it's not just necessarily the fidelity of the assets themselves, but Rift Apart is easily the best utilisation of the PS5's SSD yet. The whole dimension hopping gimmick of the game is built around it and it never stops blowing my mind, honestly. You can sit there for minutes at the edge of portals trying to break the game world, which I managed to a little bit with this glitch where you can see the red screen filter showing up across the other side of the map. So I did it, I, I defeated God. But for the most part it's absolutely seamless. Every time I load up the game, literally instantaneously, I would just sit there shaking my head like I imagine old men did back in 1969 when they saw man land on the moon for the first time. I could write more long-winded prose about how pretty it is, but maybe this footage of me getting to Blizzard Prime for the first time will do. The Blizzard appears to have stored energy from the dimensional ribs. Holy fucking shit. That was amazing. Is this your Blizzard? That was amazing. We find intact phase quartz here. We should seek out the miners. That was amazing. That is the coolest thing I have ever fucking seen in a video game. Holy shit. And it just, it just goes back. I showed this to my girlfriend and it gave her this look of wonder I have never seen in her face. She's seven, by the way. She's not, she's 24. I realise I did make her sound like a child though. She... My light just ran out of... Ow, and I hit my hand. Oh, I don't like recording videos. <laughs> I have a migraine as well, this is not my day. But she could just not wrap her head around it. Playing this game feels like the future. It gave us that cliched, wow, technology has come so far reaction. And this bit also made her extremely interested in playing the game, which is actually something like quite special to me. Watching that little bit of gameplay blow her mind and then go, holy shit, I need to play this, is a very sweet moment, especially since she knows how much I love Ratchet & Clank and now I get to share that with her. Now, on the topic of the nitty gritty technical stuff, uh, Ratchet & Clank has three performance modes. I played mine in performance ray tracing. 
thinking, hey, this will be a cool curiosity, but maybe too low resolution to actually enjoy. Nope, it looked absolutely incredible and it has stayed on throughout my entire playthrough. The lightning is so good that it has retroactively made other games look flat in comparison. My girlfriend just started God of War and I can't help but notice the lack of shadows in some places. The ray tracing, the global illumination, everything feels uh, cohesive, you know. Not once did I notice an object or character who didn't look right because of the lighting and think, ah damn, if, if only I had better lighting. There's still little moments where I can see some ray tracing noise, some surfaces and reflections look a little bit fizzy, but it's kind of balanced out by the sheer beauty of every single other aspect of the game. Unexpectedly though, I did experience a good few bugs in my playthrough, visual ones mainly, this weird blockiness appeared several times and I'm pretty sure it's ray tracing related. It wasn't quite as bad as this bug I had however. That was a fun one. Thankfully I've had nothing game breaking, but I've heard some other people having quite a few serious problems and it's pretty apparent that the game will need another one or two rounds of patching before everything is sorted out. The music. Ah, uh, this is hard for me man. I, I've thrown back and forth in my head about this a lot. I think the music is far better than it was in Ratchet 2016, where every voice line was accompanied by a whimsical bassoon. But Ratchet & Clank post PlayStation 2 has never been able to recapture the style and quality of David Burgo's original soundtrack. The electronic, cartoony beats have so much personality to them. Rift Apart's soundtrack is somewhat of an amalgamation of the two styles, generic grand cinematic orchestra and some electronic beats. Some tracks can capture the ever so slightest hint of David Burgo's original music, but for the most part, the soundtrack falls into what I would describe as generic superhero music. If you listened to this music for the first time and no one told you otherwise, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was from a Marvel movie. I've had a lot of trouble forming a concrete opinion on this because the music is, in general, absolutely fine. And I, I do mean just fine. It's unremarkable, it does its job, it's okay. And then other tracks have a little bit of electronic personality in them that I really quite enjoy, like Glitch's first level for example. I think what really sums it up is when I was looking through the OST for some example tracks, I couldn't make up my mind because all the tracks sounded exactly the same. Those hints of electronic quirkiness are really nice, but make no mistake, it's still not on the level of the PS2 games. There's no tracks that I'll be singing to myself for years to come. Oh, while talking about music, uh, I dare not spoil it, but let me just say there's a musical number during the credits, and uh, Robin Atkin Downs, he's got, he's got a cracking set of pipes on him. If there's one word you could ascribe to Rift Apart, it would be detail. It's everywhere and in everything. The weapons do little transformations out of Ratchet's hand, just like the originals. I love this detail growing up. And this small detail blew me away, I, I didn't even notice it until I'd accidentally muted the television. Listen to the sound the controller makes when charging up the pixelizer. I could, and I really do mean could go on and on about the insane amount of love put into the presentation, the cartoony squash and stretch which gives the characters that classic Disney animated weight to them, all the cameos, the references, the callbacks, it's, 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 it's molto bene. Oh wait, there is one thing I don't like, um, Rivet can do wee Fortnite dances and Zerkies. 
I know these are just dances. I know Fortnite didn't invent them. I know this is called the Charlie Brown and this is the fucking Hufflepuff or whatever it's called. But Fortnite ruined it. And there's, there's something about an obviously professionally trained dancer being motion captured over a video game character to dab that it, it just ain't right. It's just, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Like, I'm not religious, but if I was, these are the moments where I'd be throwing holy water at the TV. Because religious people are known for destroying their own televisions. I, I do like the breakdance one though. That one's, uh, that one's pretty sweet. Oh, story. This is, uh, is going to be a long part of the video. The story of Raj and Clank Rift Apart is thankfully far more engaging than the aforementioned blandness that was the 2016 reboot. You've got lots of new characters, a fun premise that is just rife with possibilities, and some lovely character development between all our cast members. There's a clear sense that Insomniac is ready to be more creative with their storytelling after the success of Spider-Man. Clank has rebuilt the Dimensionaire that first appeared in the 2007 entry Tools of Destruction so that Ratchet can finally find the dimension where the rest of his race, the Lombaxes, now live. But of course Dr Nefarious comes in and fucks everything up because he's a dipshit robot with a radio for a brain. Next thing you know, everything goes all purple and you're in a dimension where he's the boss. You get split up from Clank and the game follows both Ratchet and his alternate dimension counterpart Rivet on their quest to stop Dr Nefarious. I realise when writing this I made an attempt to avoid spoilers. See if you haven't finished the game, you won't get as much out of this. Uh, if you're going to play the game and you don't want to be spoiled, maybe don't watch the video. Or just watch it but, but on mute so YouTube thinks you did and that's what I care about. It all culminates in a very satisfying conclusion with some sequel bait at the end which I ain't mad about. But as a fan of the originals and as a nitpicker of stories, there is a lot I have to talk about. I'm not sure you'd even call some of them complaints, just observations on how the writing of the series has changed. The writing of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart feels exceptionally 2021. Like, there's no better way I can sum it up by telling you there's a robot spider with an anxiety disorder. Once so caught up in her own worries, I definitely get the sense she has a Tumblr account where she talks about her mental health troubles. Glitch is her name, she's a little spider bot companion you'll do a bunch of side missions as, and since I'm talking about her, I'd like to say, not a big fan, uh, her voice is pretty annoying, at the end of her last level she just about burst my eardrums. With how many characters deal with similar personal issues like Glitch, I think she would have been much better suited as a kind of cool-headed comic relief character to provide some balance from the exploration of mental health troubles that the game does. I do think, however, if the game's gonna talk mental health, go harder with it. You know, Ratchet, he's got PTSD now. Captain Quark, gambling addiction. Clank, chronically unemployed. Which is like, it's not a surprise. He, he, he unveils a super weapon at like the opening of the Olympics at the start of the game. Would you hire that guy? I wouldn't. He's an absolute, absolute moron. Anyway, on the topic of the story for now, it feels like it's been put through a filter of a bunch of very competent Hollywood screenwriters. Everything is good and it works, but it's all remarkably safe. There's no sharp corners or really surprises to be had. There's no edge similar to the original games. The emphasis on quirky characters acting and or doing ridiculous things isn't what it used to be. Nobody, I mean nobody, gets by the mathematician. I guess all the good names were taken. There are some nice situations that are fun, like a space pirate tavern with a sheep waiting for a drink. This Bear Grylls wannabe who's trying to make lasagna in the middle of a volcano. Rusty Pete's alternate universe poetic French counterpart, they feel almost like they have a similar spark to the originals. Characters also have a tendency to feel like they're all written by the same person. An American in the late 20s, early 30s that has a message about accepting yourself for all the kids out there. And it's a theme that's really hard to ignore. A shocking majority of the cast have some sort of inner turmoil they're working through. In a very teenage angst, oh gosh, I, I just don't know if I can do it or if I'm good enough, what if it doesn't work, kind of way. The theme of the game is very much about believing and accepting yourself, which is fine, but it's a message that is repeated constantly throughout the game and often quite heavy handedly. Oh, I apologise. There's something sort of strange I started to notice on my second playthrough of Rift Apart, and I originally thought it was that the game was a bit short. 
that it could do with a few more planets, and it kind of can. But that's not because the game actually is short, it's one of the longest Ratchet games ever made. It's that many of the levels are revisited, and this messes with the game's sense of progression in your mind. In retrospect, it doesn't feel like as much of an adventure as you might have expected. Put it this way, in Ratchet and Clank 1, if I remember correctly, there was 18 planets. In Rift Apart, there's 9. When I put it like that, it sounds worse than it is. The game is, in actuality, a really good length, about 12 to 15 hours. It's just out of those dozen or so hours, three of the levels you play are revisits of earlier planets. You return to Sargasso as Rivet to stop Nefarious' invasion, a level that only lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. Then you revisit Savali as both Ratchet and Rivet to stop Nefarious again, a level that has a large open world that you probably already spent quite a lot of time in. And then of course there's Xerxes. Xerxes is the kind of story hub of the game, and there's nothing really to this level apart from a gold boat or two in the outside area, and the combat arena, which is unfortunately kind of underwhelming. Like, it's good, but there's just 15 challenges, and it doesn't culminate in some big spectacle like the older games had. You just do all the missions, you get the boats, and then when you're done, I guess you could repeat them, but there's no real point. Admittedly, it took me some time to put my finger on it, but the second part of Rift Apart can feel less memorable and impactful than the first half due to a couple of things. The aforementioned abundance of revisits, but also the game's focus switches from platforming, exploration, combat and character growth to almost entirely spectacle and combat. In the first half of the game, it feels like a classic platforming adventure as you explore new planets in search of characters and MacGuffins. You do some platforming, you do some puzzles, discover new places, and then fight enemies. The second half of the game is revisiting planets almost exclusively to fight people with spectacle set pieces like flying Trudy to shoot down ships or to break the crew out of prison. That's not to say they aren't fun, but the gameplay pacing is somewhat thrown out the window and that's when your sense of time can start to blur together. Like Ardolis, the pirate planet for example. It's honestly a pretty short level that consists of almost entirely combat. There is a little bit of exploration, but not as much as you'd hope from your usual Ratchet & Clank level. You fight a lot of enemies, and then you get to the theme park area, which is played for comedy. I, I didn't find it funny, but whatever. The theme park comprises three areas. The first one, an annoying Simon Says minigame, which I, I, I just don't understand why it was there. It wasn't fun, and it never comes up again. Uh, then there's an empty room, and then more combat. After that, you fight even more bad guys, and the level ends. And then you move on, there's not much else to the level than that. There is extremely little platforming in these sections, apart from the little speedel races, or using the hurl shot, but the hurl shot is just a launcher, it doesn't introduce any new gameplay mechanics, and the speedel just involves holding down R1. As a result, neither feel like an engaging change of pace. This is where the pocket dimensions show off just how good they are. These optional platforming challenges were always extremely entertaining. But like I said, they're optional. Adding in more classic platforming to the latter half of the game to act as a pace breaker from the onslaught of constant combat encounters would be sorely welcome. As the first half of the game shows, the classic platforming of Ratchet is better than ever, especially with the new wall running introduced. So while the game is one of the longest Ratchet and Clank games ever made, its accelerated pacing towards the end can blur the details together. As a result, Ratchet and Rivet's journey to rebuild the Dimensionator was memorable for me, but their subsequent rush to stop Nefarious from destroying everything is a lot like my childhood. I've been told stuff happened, and I can recall bits of it, but all I can really remember is a lot of shouting and explosions. <laughs> I mentioned the characters dealing with inner turmoils that all feel very 2021. Well, Clank, Kit, Glitch, Ratchet, Captain Quantum and the Fixer these six characters all have inner troubles involving anxiety and or a loss of identity. Yeah, that's right, six different characters have the same message to tell. This is what I meant about the themes of the game being told in a heavy-handed manner. I don't mind the game having a saltier, more sentimental message for the kids, but even 12-year-olds are going to get sick of this when 70% of your cast is moping around because they didn't make it onto the school basketball team. There's also little attempt to distinguish characters' vocabularies. Like if you were to read their lines off of a page, you could be forgiven for mixing one person's lines for another. As while a lot of these characters are aliens all from different worlds, they all speak in very similar quirky Americanisms. Even this ancient Lombax monk is voiced by like a 32 year old Los Angeles voice actor number 412. Dimension 242Y8, quite possibly the cutest dimension I've ever seen. Oh. The original Ratchet and Clanks had fun satire and genuinely great humour. It could be enjoyed by anyone. 
The new Ratchet has its funny moments, but it's much more quirky than it is comedic. There's no parody of a current pop star where she sings robot propaganda, no man living his disgraced life as a monkey, and no Ratchet being the sidekick to Clank in the public eye as Clank lives his life as a movie star. It's not something that anyone bar old school fans like myself talk about, but the humour in the original stood up by itself and it didn't talk down to kids. It was a huge influence in my sense of humour growing up. I remember being 9 years old and lip syncing Nefarious' interview in Super Villain Weekly in my mirror because I knew it was funny and I wanted to be like that one day. In retrospect, now that I mention it, I, I think that's actually why Ratchet has been such a big part of my childhood. I grew up loving comedy and eventually attempted my lifelong dream of doing stand-up in 2015. But yeah, it was a busy year last year. Um, I went and graduated. That was cool. Hey, people care. Four years of my life for six people to go woo in a nice <laughs> I was semi-pro for a while. I did the fringe and everything. Uh, more ball than it's worth. But <laughs> yeah, and that's what I did until the pandemic hit and comedians started telling jokes in car parks and I was like, hmm, I'd rather eat my own testicles. Anyway, that is a very long story for a very different type of video. But as you can tell from my videos, I greatly appreciate good humour. It was a special kind of intelligent and dry humour that I have to admit to myself is not going to come back to Ratchet and Clank. The originals are like the Pixar classics. Kids will enjoy them, but there's intelligence in the writing that is made to go over the heads of children. My daughter tells me you're a man who's good with his hands, Ratchet. Sir, I, I swear I never- And that's okay because kids are exceptionally stupid. And they know they are. Unlike adults, if a joke or plot point goes over the head of a kid, they don't stress. They don't write up a Twitter post about how wholly inaccessible the themes of the boy in the striped pyjamas is to five-year-olds. They just go, eh, oh, well, look, a butterfly, and then they wander off into traffic. Prospector, how about you? And so you two are oh. absolutely identical? <laughs> you know, I'm sure I could get you apart in Toy Story 3. But Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart feels unquestionably like it was written for kids. Its messages aren't told through character actions as much as they are stated literally to other characters. A direct violation of the show-don't-tell rule of storytelling. And while I had an absolute blast, some of the soppier messages the game has are told so ham-fistedly that will make you feel like you're going to throw up a bit. For example, when Clank and Rivet find the fixer only to discover he's gone mad that he himself is broken, take a look at how Clank remedies the situation. I am fixed! What are you doing? Improvising. <clears throat> I may be different than I was, but you helped me realise I am still Clank. I mean, I know it's for kids, but Christ, it's a bit on the nose, isn't it? It's me throwing up, by the way, in case you didn't get that. It has that kind of power of friendship, school of writing vibe to it, which always feels more like it's got a message to preach rather than a story to tell. I mentioned Pixar earlier, and the game's director, Marcus Smith, cited that himself in an interview, claiming he felt like he captured that Pixar energy when his 11-year-old daughter laughed at all the jokes he was hoping for. I don't think he's quite there, however. Pixar movies have child-friendly themes, but they don't talk down to kids nearly as much. I rewatched The Incredibles recently, and I was amazed at just how excellent everything is. The writing is smart, the jokes are funny, the emotional moments hit, the callbacks are beautifully placed, and importantly, not once do you feel like it's pandering to the audience. Toy Story 1 and 2, they have messages to tell as well, but I'm pretty sure there's no moment where Woody just looks down the barrel of the lens and says, hey, it's okay if you're not like everyone else, you're beautiful just the way you are. You'd think with all my video game experience, I'd be feeling more prepared. Oh! Uh, on a side note, by the way, the situation with the fixer is kind of hilariously dark upon reflection. On the surface, it's played as this robot not being able to accept that he himself is broken and that he doesn't have control of that. But that's completely ignoring the absolutely murderous rampage that he was just on beforehand. He was literally about to crush Rivet into a furry bloody paste. So his story is less about being able to accept yourself and more about a person going on a killing spree due to a mental breakdown. Which to be honest is an event I think we'd all agree we'd like to see in the next Ratchet and Clank game. Like what if Nefarious was actually evil, not cartoon evil, but like fucked up. I'd get the collector's edition. When you get a wee statuette and it's just Ratchet's like head with his spine hanging out. Like he got sub-zero fatality. Yeah, I get that. Before I move on from talking about the game's messages, I just want to show you one more example 
After Ratchet meets Captain Quantum, he lays on the believe in yourself kids spiel pretty hard and you can even count the beat on which Ratchet decides to hammer up for all the kids watching. Because no matter how many times he screws up, he's always there when it matters most. He never stops trying. <coughs> uh, I, ho I hope that looked good because I just got minestrone soup all over my fucking keyboard. <laughs> it's in between the keys. Oh shit. CV and the spacebar are going to be sticky friends for a while yet. Also, I, I I don't know why I find it so funny that Quark's alternate dimension and counterpart is basically just him, but black. I, th I think it made me realise that Quark is actually supposed to be a human, which seems obvious, but it's something that has never even occurred to me until now. It's 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 a trend I want to see continue. I want to see all the alternate universe ethnicities of Quark. I want to see Filipino, Australian... Ghost? Speaking of the characters, I uh, should probably talk about them. So Kit is the alternate dimension counterpart to Clank, and she's also one of the aforementioned struggling with her self-confidence type of character. And I have to say, on my repeat playthrough, when Kit pops up again, I really can't help myself but to skip the cutscenes. Kit is so unbearably self-pitying that it's kind of irritating. I almost want to reach through the TV and go, oh my god, Kit, would you grow a pair of balls for Christ's sake? You do not understand. You are not safe around me. I am not a good partner. How are you not afraid of the future? With all of its unknowns. I am broken! I will always be broken! While the characters try their best to reassure her, after a while you just kind of want someone to smack the self-pity out of Kit. And this does actually kind of happen near the end where Rivet gets sick of Kit's crap and lashes out at her. And I say this from a place of understanding because, in real life, I actually used to be kind of like this myself. I wasn't particularly happy growing up and I could be one for self-pity. It's kind of comforting, it's what like I knew. But as I grew up, friends taught me that, hey, things are hard, Jordan, but if you don't at least try to lighten up, you're just making everyone else miserable. And I kind of get that sense when Kit's in the party. Because, you know, it's Ratchet and Clank, we're on this grand adventure and then you turn to Kit and she's just like, listening to My Chemical Romance and being an emo in the corner and it's like, dude, can you... Come on, can we have some energy here, please? Sorry. Although I did like when you're at the Forge planet and she like makes up that she's an interior designer. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. That's what I want to see. Come on. Let's see. The cat, that's what I like to see. Bring the energy levels up. Very nice. The over kidification of the storytelling makes it into a lot of the characters and their dialogue. Like, for example, whoever wrote Zircon Jr.'s lines, pl please just fire him. I, I don't think I really need to explain why this guy is annoying. I was gonna say their kids will find it funny, but like you could you could give Clank a bunch of poo-poo pee pee jokes and kids would find that funny. So maybe not the best metric for quality. Strangely, in some interviews I've seen Insomniac staff talk about Ratchet and Clank, like it wasn't always a very easy to pick up and play kids game. But they've turned up the kidification to eleven in this one, and I don't really think it's for the better. Whether that's everyone struggling with their self-confidence or of course the big bad beast on the Forge Planet finding true love with a hideous other beast. It's a, it's a bit much sometimes. That being said, uh, I do quite like Rivet. She's cool. She's confident. I think that her nickname for Clank actually makes a lot of sense. She calls him Bolts, which is almost kind of a derogatory term for robot if you think about it. It's kind of a reductive thing. He's, he's a robot. He's made of Bolts. I'll call him Bolts. It's kind of a rude thing to say a robot, but as we know, she doesn't trust robots, so ah, that, kind of, that kind of makes sense. Uh, likewise, the alternate universe counterparts are fun, but we don't really see that much of them. Skid McMarks, which is funny, man. That guy's name is Poo. This guy's name name is Poo McJobby Stain. Like, <laughs> like that's that's funny. I don't care how old you are. That's a funny name for a guy. Um, his alternate universe version, uh, Phantom. You don't really hear that much of him, and Phantom is kind of like very serious. Captain Quantum. What we see of him is pretty decent. Uh, and Pierre, I like him. He's good fun. I do like that the Zircons like run a family business now and the introduction of Mr Zircon greeting his clientele by saying Namaste is pretty funny. So whoever wrote that joke, good for you. That, that, that You got a thumbs up for me. Namaste and peace be with you, Rivet. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart does have humour, but it's less current day satire like the PS2 games and more 2020 American quirkiness. 
That's not to say it's particularly bad. If you know my videos, you know I nitpick and analyse everything. Comedy, as you might imagine, is pretty high up on that list. But the humour of Rift Apart doesn't strike me as eye-rollingly bad. It's fine most of the times, and sometimes even quite charming. But sadly, it can fall into bland territory every now and again. This is coming from someone who did stand up for four years, however, so I'll concede that I'd be pretty hard to please at this point. Before I forget, let me address some wee plot points I took note on. Clang doesn't really have that much to do in the story. Well, he he does, but it doesn't feel earned. The point of Clank's little levels is to fix the rifts and learn how to stop the dimensions from falling apart, which he does, but we, we have no idea how. Like, we just do his puzzles, and then at the end of his final puzzle, he says, I know how to stop the cataclysm. I know how to stop the cataclysm. And in the ending cutscene, he, he just, like, bashes in some numbers in the dimensionator and fixes everything. Like, Clank, what, what, do you, what, do you, what did you do? If it was that simple, could you tell me as well, just in case I need to rip a hole through space and time to grab a McDonald's and don't accidentally destroy existence? Oh, another thing. I know, I like to nitpick. And I'm not mad about this, I just find it kind of funny. So, the majority of the game is about Ratchet Rivet, Kit and Clank making a new Dimensionator. It's a big deal and it takes a lot of work, it's what you do throughout the whole game. But if that's the case, how the hell did Clank just make one at the start of the game? Like, he just has one? It's what the game starts off with? Did he run about all the galaxies doing all this crazy shit by himself? Just so he could get Ratchet a cracking Christmas present? Oh, and one last little note before I move on. Um, you know, for as much as I've criticised the direction of the writing, it's um, it's kind of all pretty competent and, you know, enjoyable. But Kit being the warbot that took Rivet's arm is telegraphed so poorly, it really quite annoyed me. I'm not usually one to latch onto these things, you know, calling out plot points before they happen. In fact, in my friend group, I'm usually the last. But Rivet mentioned she lost her arm to a warbot, and then the only other variety of warbot that's even ever mentioned again in the game is Kit. The drama is a neat idea, and I do like it, but its setup is so obvious that it did take away from the emotion of it all. While I do like to complain a lot, there really is so much enthusiasm and love behind this game that it's, it's hard not to smile, you know? The celebration of all things fun in PlayStation is great, the cameos of other PlayStation characters through the Rhino 8, some looking a little bit worse for wear, as you can see Sly Cooper's been doing some real dodgy shit to keep himself afloat nowadays, the constant references to old Ratchet games and the gorgeous storyboards during the credits which act as a little epilogue, they're fantastic too. One moment they even flew over my head until my new game plus playthrough, Nefarious says at the start, Is what I get for giving my assistant paid paternity. Quickly. And sure enough, in the credits, there's Lawrence with his wife and child. It's wonderful. Some bits really do hit me as well. Rivet and Kit's argument towards the end is really well done. It's nice to see someone finally get mad in a believable way in a game so full of endless reassurance. It provides some nice balance. The game's combat arena, being the side business of a family-run space tavern, that's pretty good. Or during the finale when Quantum and Quark meet one another and they get on like a house on fire. Like of course an absolute narcissist would be instant best friends with his alternate universe self. My many grievances with Rift Apart's storytelling, characters and severe lack of HR Geiger body horror aside, the important part is none of it managed to ruin what was a very enjoyable adventure. I'm very happy to say the game's movement is fantastic, maybe the best it's ever been in a Ratchet & Clank game. The additions made all feel very purposeful and useful, the dash adds great fluidity to traversal, but more so than that, it's a necessity in combat. Getting around shielded enemies or just completing more difficult arena missions requires you to be quick on your feet if you want to survive. Yes, that's right, in a Ratchet & Clank game, you have to actively attempt not to die. As much as the old ratchets are fun, there's no pretending that just strafe jumping left and right until everything's dead can get boring. Ratchet games used to be known for their lack of difficulty, but Rift Apart introduces fun challenges with the new tools you're given, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a big step forward in Ratchet's game design. Since Spider-Man, I think Insomniac have really learned the value of great feeling movement, and the hover boots feel like the culmination of what they've learned so far. The hover boots have been in most, if not every game since too, but this is far and away their best implementation. They let you run around at a good sprinting pace, but with some pulls of the L2 trigger, you go into blast off mode and the sense of speed is brilliant. It comes back together in the combat as well. When you're getting overwhelmed, if you can avoid getting hit for a few seconds, you have enough time to charge your boots up to full speed and get out of there. 
It's a skillful dance back and forth between combat and traversal mechanics, and it's pulled off so well you would never know this was their first time using the hover boots in this manner. Once you get good with them, you can even skip past quite large platforming sections. In fact, there's some areas I managed to get through with the hover boots, and I wasn't sure if I was doing what the devs intended, or if I just accidentally skipped massive puzzle and platforming sections altogether. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing though. The guns feel, as you might expect, fantastic of course. I never understood the need for a sniper rifle in a ratchet game, but the headhunter is a joy to use. There's a beautiful juicy thwack when you fire it, it never stops being satisfying. And the size of these levels means a long range weapon is actually quite useful. You know, in fact, juicy is the word that I'd use to describe the way a lot of these weapons sound. Combine it with the controller speaker and the haptic feedback, it, it never stops feeling great. Oh, by the way, side note, finding armour as collectibles, I really like that and I absolutely love that you can customise colours and the way you wear them. Big fan of the Ratchet and Clank fashion. Huge fan. But I don't know why I'm talking like Donald Trump right now, but he's a tremendous fan. While the weapons are as fun as ever, many of them feel like they fulfil similar niches to one another and so it can be easy to forget about them altogether. For example, the Pixelizer and the Enforcer are both shotguns, but the Enforcer is just a shotgun that's kind of harder to aim. Likewise, the Cold Snap, Mr. Fungi, the Topiary Sprinkler, Agent's Doom, and the Drone Thingy, I've forgotten the name of, are all weapons that act as additional damage, you just kind of throw them out and then forget about them, but none are particularly great for any one situation over another, so in boss fights it makes sense to just throw all of them out at once before getting your own big weapon ready. Agents of Doom run around and hurt enemies by biting them, but Mr. Fungi can do that while shooting and flying from range so he's just better in every way than the agents, so why would I ever use them? They're certainly not all perfect, but aim sensitivity on the headhunter can be unusably high sometimes. The shield generator sounded very cool in concept until I realised you don't absorb damage to power up the shield, locking bullets just drains your ammo quicker. Likewise, I think a lot of things are a little bit broken. As I said, the game has some glitches, and I really liked using the cheat code, which gave me damage numbers. But with the pixelizer, sometimes I do 1200 damage, sometimes I do 300 damage, Charging it up never seemed to make any difference, and I couldn't really figure out how I was doing a lot of damage and why it was working. Likewise, the Rhino 8 looks amazing and it's very good at clearing out large swabs of enemies, but if you use it on a boss, sometimes it does some damage and sometimes it does no damage, and I don't know if it's supposed to be a balancing thing or if it just doesn't work. It seems like it doesn't work, which is a shame because it's supposed to be the best gun in the game and it's not fair. It's weird. I think, and I can't believe I'm saying this. I think Ratchet could actually take a cure or two from Doom Eternal. In Eternal, many weapons are very good for one type of enemy over another, so it makes sense to mix and match. Ratchet could definitely do with more situational enemies that require use of all your wacky arsenal, because it always is a shame when you get a weapon in a Ratchet game, but there's just no reason to use it because there are better alternatives. There is a small example of this in the game already however, the aforementioned shielded enemies require you to utilise bombs and other throwables that can flank enemies to damage them. It's really nice to have to think about what weapon I need to use in that situation, but sadly they're kind of the only example of that. Enemy variety in general isn't the game's strong point either. Much like God of War 2018, the majority of the bosses you'll be fighting are repeats. The Seekerpede, Nefarious Juggernauts and Grunthors, you'll be fighting a lot of them. Like a lot. And I must admit, while the combat is super fun, fighting the same bosses again and again got a bit tiresome by the time you're on your fifth round against the big red guy from Ozzy and Drix. While the game is beautiful and most of the time controls like a charm, it does have its rough spots. Trudy, the flying abomination, has uncharacteristically terrible controls. I promise the footage you're watching right now is of me trying to land her sober, I did not pop some quaaludes and then start recording for the lols. And strangely some areas are very awkward to travel back through. Like awful enough that I wonder if the QA testers didn't quite manage to find everything before they shipped the game. Judging by the bugs, I think that's probably the case. For example, in the Forge Planet, when you slide down the little icy slide thing, you can't get back up. So to get back to your ship, you need to run through the entire level, which takes about a full minute and a half at full speed. At this point, I'm going through most of my notes to see what else there is, but there's so much thought behind the game that most of it isn't really an issue. While I find Glitch's missions quite satisfying, even if I'd rather have my eardrums intact, I'm not particularly excited about doing Clank's puzzles again. It's not that they're bad, it's just that the rest of the game is so much better. I'd rather be doing that. But hey, I can't complain because you can just skip them on the pod screen. 
And while I'm on the topic, I feel like poor Clank doesn't really have much to do now. One of Ratchet's canned voice lines after a fight you might hear, Ratchet will turn to Clank and go, ha, couldn't have done it without you buddy. When in fact in this game, he totally can. In Rift Apart more so than ever, not having Clank with you makes little to no difference to the gameplay. While the weighty, beautifully animated sway you get when you glide down with Clank on your back looks great, if he's not there, well, you just hover down with your boots instead. You can't long jump or high jump anymore either, and I love the constant amount of mobility you're given, but I feel kind of bad that the guy with his name on the box doesn't actually provide any gameplay difference to you whatsoever. Regardless of what little details I'm pulling up to talk about now, the important part is this game made me excited about games. Playing this has made me want to go back and play God of War, Spider-Man, The Last of Us. It captures the pure fun of video games so well that it just kind of lit a fire in my passionate gamer body. It reminded me of this one time I was on morphine, right? I got, sorry, I was I had surgery and they gave me morphine. Just And I woke up and this nurse gave me like this, this very mediocre tuna sandwich and like kind of some semi-warm orange juice. And I was eating it, and I was like, this is the best sandwich I've ever had. And then I had the orange juice, and I was like, that is, that is so, it's so delicious. And I turned to the nurse, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not usually like this. And that's what this game is. Rift Apart has elements of that. It's just, but what I'm trying to say is that the new Ratchet & Clank game is better than Morphine. It's not, Morphine is, Morphine is good. Uh, don't do it though, kids. Unless it's like, you know, Christmas or your birthday. There's elements of that in this game. Whatever gripes I may have, it perfectly captures that sense of adventure and fun that's unique to video games. That type of fun that's got me through many hard days and for my childhood. It's a wonderful time. But while Rift Apart isn't the ratchet that I was dreaming of a return to, I think it's about time I accept it's sadly not going to happen. A new odd character at every level ain't the PS2 anymore, Jordan. Pop culture satire while Clank Moonlights is a movie star, let it go. Even the PS3 games were like this, as much as I'd like to think so. Ratchet has been different for a long time now. But just like the PS3 games, I love Drift Apart. They're not the originals, and they're not perfect, but I need to stop chasing that dragon, admit that maybe I'm being a bit of a video game boomer, and accept that while the Ratchet of my childhood has changed, his games are still, thankfully, pretty damn good. Like always. What a load of bullsh. Nice Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Not gonna lie, see when you end up, you know, writing a 6,000 word script and then making a real long video about it. You kind of never want to see a video game ever again. So I'm gonna leave it a while and come back. It's a very introspective video because I saw other people talking about it and complaining about stuff and I realised lots of us, we were just nitpicking. Like the game is really good. It's just kind of different. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to see what they do next. If you got to the end, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I do videos like these. I do wee gameplay videos in between. And my cat's at the fucking door. Jesus Christ. Miko, what do you want? What? What do you think of Ratchet and Clank? No, come here. See this noisy asshole? You know how difficult it is to film with this furry little fuck? You put him in one gameplay video and suddenly he thinks he's the shit. Yeah, yeah, very good. What did you think? Thanks for watching, guys. Alright, alright, neighbor, just put your butthole on my microphone. <laughs>